Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you here, and uh, we'll be discussing microspheres and nanoparticles for peptide delivery. Uh, unfortunately, Chris McGee, our Director of Business Development, was not able to join us today, so I will be your moderator. Uh, my name is Laura Milbrandt. I am the Business Development Manager for the Western U.S. region uh, at Bauchem Americas, and I am based out of Boulder, Colorado. So I'm sure many of you um, are already friends of Bauchem and familiar with the work that we do, uh, but for those of you that are not, here's a brief introduction. Uh, we're approaching our 50th birthday, and over the past 50 years, we've really established ourselves as the leader in the development and manufacturing of peptide-based entities. More recently, we sought to do the same in the uh, field of oligonucleotides, or oligos. A little more about what Bauchem has to offer. Uh, we offer a comprehensive range of services, uh, but I would say our main goal is to partner with sponsors as early on as possible in the development process, um, usually at the early uh, research and development stage. Uh, we then work with our customers to progress through IND enabling talk studies um, into human clinical trials and ultimately support their commercial uh, launches and applications. We're able to support regulatory filings around the world, uh, most commonly uh, being NDAs, VLAs, ANDAs, and MMA MAAs. And we have the largest portfolio of existing generics in the industry. Now, a point of clarification, we're going to talk a lot today about the formulation of drug products. And although this is not a core service offering at Bauchem, what we hope to make clear is that in order to prop up this field, you'll need robust manufacturing controls, robust analytical controls, and these are areas where Bauchem has immense expertise to contribute to furthering the progress in this field. So where can you find us? Uh, we have two GMP manufacturing sites in California, uh, in Torrance and in Vista. We also have uh, two manufacturing sites, both GMP in Switzerland, with our largest site and headquarters being in Bubendorf, Switzerland, outside of Basel. We have a non-GMP center of excellence in the UK. And more recently, we have a business office in Tokyo, Japan. So how can you interact as a participant? Uh, at any time during the presentation, you can write us a question using the Q&A button listed here um, in this photo. And at the end of the presentation, I will go through the questions um, and we'll ask, we'll ask those to our speaker. Uh, and now a little about our speaker, uh, Jyoti Thundamanthathil. Jyoti is the Associate Director of CMC, or Chemistry Manufacturing and Controls, at Bauchem Americas at our Torrance site. He has over 20 years of experience in peptides. He began with his PhD in India, and from there he went on to do postdoc, uh, postdoctoral work at the National Chemical Laboratory in Pune, Lechner Center in Israel, and IU. PUI and Purdue University in Indiana. He has more than 60 publications in the field of peptides. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jyoti. Take it away. Hello, Laura. Thank you so much uh, for your introduction. I would also like to welcome all of you to this uh, seminar here. Uh, Thank you for participating. Um, so, as you know, the you know drug development involves uh, so many different stages, and uh, you know it takes several years for a drug uh, to really come to the market. It involves. Uh, uh, number of stages, uh, basic research, um, identification of drug targets, um, uh, molecules that bind to the target, which are lead molecules, optimization of the lead molecules, from there uh, moving into in vitro studies, in vivo studies, um, animal talk studies, and, and, and uh, from there it moves to the uh, human clinical trials. And, and during these uh, 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 human clinical trials, you, had, you have to make the uh, 
drugs, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients under uh, GMP manufacturing conditions. Um, um, and also an, another important part of this development is the um, formulation of the drug itself so that it can be safely administered to patients. Uh, during the manufacturing, we would also validate the process, get ready for uh, uh, commercial manufacturing and distribution. So all this takes several years, uh, even though, uh, you know, you can see that sometimes, you know, for example, vaccines uh, that were developed recently for, uh, 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 for COVID, uh, uh, you know, a lot of companies were able to get this into market within a year or so. Even though a lot of basic research has been already done on those uh, things, and a lot of vaccines has been produced in the past. But for a typical API, it takes a long time for that to get to the market. Uh, so, so here uh, we are talking about microspheres and nanoparticles for peptide dealers. So we are focusing mainly on the uh, peptides here. Um, so today's presentation um, will have uh, uh, three or four different uh, aspects that we'll be talking about. Uh, the first one is the peptide delivery challenges. We'll, we'll look at some of the common routes of uh, peptide uh, delivery. Um, then we'll uh, talk about the uh, use of microspheres and nanoparticles in peptide delivery. Um, at the end, a couple of slides, I'll be talking about the importance of API manufacturing for uh, making microspheres and nanoparticles. So let's get into the peptide delivery challenges. Sort of us know uh, that uh, there are several routes for uh, administration of any drug. Uh, for example, peptides are uh, mostly uh, uh, administered via um, parent rural route uh, uh, and other non-invasive routes such as uh, nasal, transdermal, pulmonary and oral routes are also available. But there are only few dr uh, peptide drugs which are in the market which are administered orally. Most of the, most of the peptide drugs, as you know, are uh, administered uh, through parent rural route. Uh, each of these uh, routes has its own merits and demerits. For example, um, I, I let me go to the oral route, for example, you know, we know that why peptide cannot be administered orally, basically because of the presence of proteolytic enzymes in the GI tract, um, which leads to the pure, poor stability of the peptide drugs and, and, and degrades. And, uh, and also the large molecular size, uh, it has poor permeability. So that's one of the reasons why the, uh, you won't see a lot of oral drugs, oral peptide drugs. Um, but with the formulation, this, uh, it's possible. Uh, formulation, formulating uh, peptide drugs through nanoparticles, for example, is uh, actually a lot of progress in this area. Um, and parenteral route, even, even for the parenteral route, uh, you, know, you would encounter in vivo, a short in vivo half-life meaning that uh, you will need to do frequent injections um, that would ultimately uh, result into poor patient compliance. Other non-invasive routes like nasal and pulmonary are also becoming popular. But again, in these cases, the main challenges are because of the large size and uh, of these molecules, uh, proteins. Now, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not very efficient. Uh, another route actually is the uh, transdermal route. Um, uh, and the challenges here is the hydrophilicity and large molecular size of peptides while interacting with, for example, uh, lipid bilayer. So, so that is where uh, the, to overcome these challenges, a lot of these challenges, uh, uh, micros particles, uh, and nanoparticles, this area has expanded so much and is, they are emer emerging as an alternative solution for peptide delivery. 
um, microparticles have been, you know, you know that has been used in in many small molecule uh, uh, drugs. Um, uh, the main advantage here is that you, if you can encapsulate peptides in these uh, systems, which we can call carrier systems, uh, it could it could lead to better uh, drug profile. It could improve the solubility of the drugs. For example, if uh, hydrophobic uh, uh, peptides, uh, uh, you could uh, improve the solubility by um, in encapsulating it into a microparticle or a nanoparticle. You could also make uh, uh, long-acting depot formulations uh, for a controlled drug release. Uh, and specific uh, drug targeting is also available with this, this technique. Let's uh, move on to the mic microspheres and look at what are uh, some basic information about the microspheres here. What are microspheres? Um, uh, so micro, micro encapsulation basically is the en encapsulation or coating of a material with, uh, with uh, typically a polymer or a lipid to generate uh, free-flowing micrometric particles. So the particle size of these microspheres are between one to a thousand micrometers. Historically, uh, micro encapsulation was first described in 1931 uh, in, in the use of gelatin uh, microparticles for encapsulation of ink. Um, so the application of microspheres in the area of pharmaceutics, pharmaceutics started around in 1950s uh, and aspirin is the one of the first micro encapsulated drugs that was designed in 1950s. Uh, let's look into the drug release. Uh, how, how and once you encapsulate a drug inside the microspheres, how, how does it comes out of this, uh, these shells? So there are two, uh, two mechanisms for a release of the drug from a microsphere. The first one is the diffusion. It, uh, the drug can simply diffuse out of the, uh, the microsphere and uh, release into the system. Um, so we'll look into some of the properties of the microspheres later. Uh, how does it happen? Because the microspheres are, are porous. So there is a possibility of diffusion of these uh, drug molecules outside. Uh, second one is the which is the most common, uh, commonly used uh, technique is the the polymer erosion. These polymeric uh, micro uh, uh, spheres get uh, eroded uh, under certain conditions, and ultimately uh, uh, the drug actually comes out into the system. So here, the, uh, so. Uh, so um, so the, as I told you earlier, that there are a lot of parameters uh, that influences the uh, polymer uh, microparticle design. So these are the different uh, parameters, porosity, shape, polydispersity, size, surface modification. Uh, these are the most important uh, uh, parameters. Sorry, the slide is moving a little faster. Go back to the previous slide. So the porosity, for example, uh, you know, the porosity of microsphere uh, spheres influence the, um, the diffusion of the uh, drug molecules uh, and also the uh, release of the drugs into the system. Um, shape, for example, uh, influence the interaction of the uh, microspheres and drug particles with uh, the ma macrophages. Uh, or if you, the surface modifications are important in, in, in tackling uh, immune response, et cetera. Uh, how do you make the micro, there are uh, different uh, uh, type of molecule, uh, different type of material that can use for uh, the preparation of microspheres. There are, you can use natural materials like, such as proteins, for example, uh, albumins, gelatin, collagen, etc. Uh, you can also use carbohydrates. Uh, for example, chitosan is one of the most widely used uh, in, in the preparation of microspheres, as well as for uh, nanoparticles. Uh, chemically modified carbohydrates. Uh, you can use biodegradable synthetic uh, polymers. 
out of which PLGA, this is the most widely used, uh, PLGA is the most widely used uh, uh, material for uh, making the microspheres. And other uh, uh, non-biodegradable synthetic uh, materials are also used uh, in, in certain cases. Uh, preparation of microspheres, uh, you can uh, prepare, there are uh, uh, varieties of methods uh, are used uh, for making micro uh, These are some of the examples here. Single immersion techniques, double immersion techniques, uh, cryogenic methods, interfacial polymerization, co-isolation. This is one of the oldest method. Uh, spray drying methods are used, solvent evaporation methods. So when I look at the literature, uh, the solvent evaporation method is the most commonly used method for uh, for uh, preparation of microspheres containing peptides. And uh, when you make the microspheres, there are a lot of other parameters are important. Quality of microspheres are important. Quality of the and quantity of the drug uh, you have um, are pretty important. Uh, drug loading is another parameter. Stability of the drug inside the microspheres. Uh, because when you make them, uh, when you try, when you make, when you encapsulate the peptide inside the microspheres, you, sometimes you are uh, you are subjecting the drug to, to harsh conditions. Uh, crystallinity of the of the microspheres, particle size and distance. So these are all important parameters that you, that needs to be uh, taken care of while uh, preparing microspheres. Um, varieties of methods are there uh, for uh, characterizing uh, microspheres, such as uh, scanning electron microscope, ATR, uh, uh, DSC, uh, XRD, optical microscopy, etc., are used for characterization. Sorry. As I, as I told you earlier, the uh, the major this uh, major advantages of uh, the microspheres uh, are uh, here. Uh, the first one is the controlled release of a drug to specific drug uh, targets uh, is possible with the use of microsphere. Uh, you are able to protect the uh, an unstable drug um, inside this micro microsphere shell. Uh, you can also uh, manipulate the in vivo action, uh, change the pharmacokinetic profile, uh, tissue distribution and cellular interaction of the drug. Uh, when you do the, uh, you are not supposed to change the chemical structure of the drug when you do the uh, microsphere formation or when you, when you encapsulate a peptide inside a microsphere or, or whenever you do a formulation of the drug, you are you are basically not altering the chemical structure of the molecule, but you are you are imparting better stability. You are able to uh, uh, change the. You are able to have better pharmacokinetic profiles. Um, so, if you use the microsphere, for example, you can you can ultimately reduce the frequency of administration with a better acceptance by the patient by controlled release of the drug into the system. Uh, it could eliminate fluctuations in serum concentration of the drug. Um, so you can decrease the total dosage required for the treatment uh, due to the uh, possibility of higher uh, bioavailability of the, uh, the, the dose that is administered. And also, uh, uh, you also decrease the adverse events going to the decrease in the amount of drug delivered in the body at the moment of administration. So you can you can pretty much control the drug delivery using microspheres uh, formulations. Um, the, there are uh, several examples of uh, peptide microsphere formulations. Uh, there are these are all these are drugs which are already in the market formulated as microspheres. These are some of the examples here, Lupron, Depot, uh, Solardex, Gasserolin, basically, Trellstar, Octreotide, Lantreotide, TRH, Busserolin, Abaralix, uh, Exinator. So these are some of the, there are several other examples. There are a lot of other uh, studies ongoing now, uh, to, you know, with an aim to uh, increase the uh, stability of the drug as well as for uh, better delivery of the drugs. Uh, of course, any any um, any any method or any any strategy has its own limitations. There are some limitations that I have uh, highlighted here. 
Um, so first one is the difficulty of large scale management. So this is uh, one of the issues with uh, microspheres. Uh, you you have to make this under aseptic conditions, and the, 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 there are sometimes difficulties in the, in the scale of this uh, manufacturing of uh, microspheres. Uh, another um, um, Another uh, limitation is the inact possible inactivation of the drug during the fabrication. As I earl ex explained earlier, when you make the um, uh, the micro microspheres, for example, if you use a solvent evaporation method, there is a possibility that it would it would inactivate the, the drug. It could um, it could influence the stability stability of the drug if you are using a harsh conditions uh, during the uh, microsphere formation. Uh, sometimes uh, poor control of the drug release rates uh, has, has seen, I mean, uh, um, are noticed, um, and then the, and another another important issue is the aggregation and the in incomplete release uh, from the microsphere. So some some peptide drugs tend to aggregate, and this would lead to incomplete release of the peptide drug from the microsphere. So let's uh, now move on to the. Uh, now move on to the next topic, which is the uh, nanoparticles. So nanoparticles, uh, as, mo as, as all of you know, these are uh, smaller particles compared to microspheres uh, with a particle size range from uh, 10 nanometer to 1000 nanometers. Um, uh, there are so, so many different types of nanoparticles available. For example, um, micelles, liposomes, which are the most commonly used. There are nanogels, nano emulsions, uh, and, and, and different types of uh, nanoparticles such as fullerenes, um, um, dent dentimers, and uh, things like that. There are so many different types, metal nanoparticles. Um, so this is a huge area which uh, nanoparticles are uh, employed in uh, different areas of science. So, so the use of nanoparticles in uh, drug delivery has attracted um, unprecedented attention in the last uh, two decades. Because with nanoparticles of small size, you have a larger surface area, meaning that you have a high ratio of surface area to volume and which would you know, facilitate uh, better interaction of the drug uh, with the targets. Um, uh, it also promote high degree of surface ab ab absorption by drugs, and proteins and other molecules. Let's look into the major advantages of using uh, nanoparticles. So uh, nanoparticles, uh, could lead to enhanced solubility profiles and, and therefore uh, better bioavailability. Uh, just like um, in the case of microspheres, you have the ability to for the controlled release of a drug to a specific target site. Um, um, and also you can you can protect an unstable drug inside the by, by you know inside a nanoparticle uh, shell. Um, um, absorption through uh, tight junctions of endothelial cells of the skin is possible uh, uh, when you when you deliver a drug using nanoparticles. I'll, I'll go into some of the details of the drug delivery uh, using nanoparticles in the next slide. Um, and then you can also have an alternate delivery targets using uh, nanoparticles. Uh, that are different strategies, for example, colon delivery through colon, uh, getting more popular uh, in recent days. Um, um, and the ability to cross uh, blood-brain barrier uh, and also ability to enter the uh, pulmonary uh, system um, and ability to, to pass through the fenestrated vas vasculature of tumors so that you will have, uh, uh, that is done by using, for example, pegylation of the micelle. If you pegylate the micelle, you have, you know, it has been shown that you have uh, is possibility of higher concentration of the drug in tumor cells as opposed to the normal cells. Um, you can also manipulate the in vivo action, pharmacokinetic profile, uh, tissue distribution, and uh, cellular interaction of the drug. So the, uh, there's a lot of uh, advantages of uh, using nanoparticles. So there are. Uh, of different ways of how uh, the nanoparticles uh, 
pass through the intestinal uh, barrier, for example. There are two, two mechanisms, paracellular transport and transcellular transport. Um, so the paracellular transport is not an easy, easy route. Uh, it, goes, it, it actually happens through a tight junction, but the smaller size of the nanoparticles, this is uh, becoming possible this paracellular transport. The, the paracellular transport amounts to only a very small percentage of the transport, uh, overall transport of uh, drug uh, through the intestinal uh, barrier. A transcellular cellular support, uh, transport basically um, is the most favored uh, trans, uh, transport mechanism. It could happen through a a receptor mediated uh, transport or, or, or endocytosis or a M cell uh, mediated endocytosis. Uh, most of the uh, most of the nanoparticle drugs are transported through these two mechanisms, either through a receptor uh, mediated or a M cell mediated, uh, uh, you know, transcellular support. Uh, sorry, transport. So uh, there are varieties of methods for preparation of nanoparticles. They can be nanoparticles can be encapsulated, could be adsorbed or chemically linked to the surface of uh, um, nanoparticles. Uh, so you can you can actually peptides. You can in most in mostly the formulation is you you actually try to ad adsorb or uh, you know mix the different ingredients. But now, now these days we are moving towards more towards more controlled uh, formulation where you can basically link broad peptides uh, to the surface of uh, nanoparticles. So this is one of the reasons why Barkham actually is introducing this as an innovative uh, um, idea uh, because uh, you know you have to link these uh, peptides to the surface of nanoparticles. So the conjugation techniques are very important. You know, this, so this is not just mixing uh, different components to make a formulation here. So Bakem has the capability to, uh, to attach peptides to some of these uh, components of nanoparticles, for example, lip liposomes or, uh, or, or lipids uh, or other uh, solid lipid nanoparticle systems or polymeric nanoparticles. Um, Polymer, so out of the uh, different uh, nanoparticle systems that are available, polymeric nanoparticles exhibit uh, higher stability in biological fluids compared to the liposomes and solid uh, lipid nanoparticles. So this is becoming very popular uh, in the drug delivery area. Um, among the nano, uh, natural polymers, so chitosan has shown the most interesting potential, uh, which is basically attributed to its uh, better st solubility at intestinal pH. So, uh, so here are some of the examples of uh, different uh, uh, natural and uh, synthetic polymers that can be used uh, in the preparation of nanoparticles, gelatin, chitosan, alginate, and uh, synthetic polymers as I uh, told you earlier, PLG is the most common synthetic uh, polymeric nanoparticle. Uh, um, so many different techniques are there and experimental uh, techniques for characterizations are available, um, such as uh, ionic gelation, uh, emulsification polymerization, interfacial polymerization, etc. So many methods are available. Now let's be, let me uh, show you some of the uh, examples of uh, peptide nanoparticle formulation. Uh, you might be knowing that uh, there are already uh, so, you know, few drugs in the market uh, which utilizes the nanoparticle formulation for uh, small molecules. Uh, for ex a lot of like, cytotoxic agents such as doxorubicin and uh, anti some of the anti-cancer drugs are formulated as uh, nanoparticles. Um, for peptides, uh, the for peptide nanoparticles area is still in the early stage. There are uh, a lot of ongoing work. If you look at the literature, you will see a lot of the, lot of peptides are being uh, being formulated in uh, in nano using nanoparticles. Restasis. This is an uh, this is a drug which is uh, used in, in dry eye syndrome, and uh, the, so this is basically 
uh, a cyclosporin a lot of plga basically and then insulin uh, insulin uh, people are trying to in uh, trying to uh, encapsulate insulin inside uh, different nanoparticles um, other examples are loprolite uh, neurotoxin um calcitonin for example uh, for pulmonary delivery here also you can see that the 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 varieties of different delivery routes that you can use um, when you use nanoparticle formations so it, it's not just uh, um, oral delivery but there are deliveries uh, platforms like um, pulmonary delivery nose to brain ocular delivery as i mentioned earlier uh, delivery through colon and Uh, there are uh, thousands and thousands of uh, um, publication that you can see people are trying to use nanoparticles for uh, peptide delivery uh, i think in future you will see uh, most of these things uh, and a lot of these things getting commercialized as well uh, here you see another example for a neuroprotective peptide uh, a b6 peptide functionalized peg pla so here uh, Uh, you uh, people are also trying to functionalize nanoparticles with peptides which can target to specific uh, sites uh, um, you can also functionalize peptides with uh, cell penetrating peptides which would enable the the penetration of the peptides into the cell and also specifically to uh, certain drug targets so that is where uh, i think uh, bakham can contribute to these areas where you can attach uh, peptides to uh, to peg or uh, pla and and similar kind of nanoparticles uh, moieties um, th these are some of the limitations of nanoparticle delivery systems uh, uh, sometimes a possible non specific interaction with different types of cells organs or tissues are uh, is possible um uh, poor control of drug release rates and biodistribution has been seen if you don't choose right uh, nanoparticle systems um uh, and the uh, biggest issue is their clearance by lymphatic system you know that small more small particles the uh, uh, um, you know the lymphatic system has a tendency to clear uh, smaller particles from our uh, from our body uh, i would say uh, to avoid the clearance by a lymphatic system uh, you know a typically a 100 nanometer size is the acceptable range of a nanoparticle uh, to avoid this uh, clearance by the lymphatic systems um uh, and you also would need uh, toxicity stat tox tox studies may, uh, done on this uh, on this uh, nanoparticle delivery system if 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 we are basically if you are using a small, new 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 type of uh, uh, nanoparticle delivery system you have to demonstrate that these are these are not uh, toxic just like you do the tox studies on the api you will also need to do you need to generate data on the toxicity of this uh, nanoparticle systems um, and then aggregation is again another problem um, cost of manufacturing could be high in in some cases um, and specific regulatory guidelines uh, might be needed in future there are not so many gu guidelines now at this point uh, let's look into the some of these uh, what's available at this point for the nanoparticle uh, systems uh, uh, as far as the uh, regulatory agencies are concerned in couple of uh, in, i will be discussing about in the next few slides um so in the next few slides uh, uh sorry actually it's here uh, the um i skip that slide here uh, so the fda and nanotechnology so fda has issued uh, several guidance documents on topics uh, relating to the application of nanotechnology in fda regulated products you will see a lot of regulations a re lot of guidance documents for, relating mostly to uh, food industry because uh, you know nano part nanotechnology is, is being used in uh, a lot in food industry or or in or in cosmetics and things uh, and, and and related areas um so there is a guidance for uh, uh, for uh, pharma here a final guidance for industry liposome drug products 
chemistry manufacturing controls, human pharmacokinetics and bioavailability enabling and documentation. Um, and then there is a draft guidance for industry by FDA drug products, including biological products that contain nanomaterials. So there are not many guidances uh, at this point, uh, but there are, uh, there, are, uh, there are certain material which are designated by FDA to be safe, to be, you know, you can use it uh, safely in, uh, in nanoparticle or micro, microsphere formulations. But if you, if you go for a, a novel uh, type of um, nanoparticle delivery system, other than uh, what I have mentioned earlier, uh, then you'll have to demonstrate that uh, you know, these, these are not toxic or, and, and uh, um, you will need uh, further documentation to show that. So, so far we have, so we discussed, uh, um, um, uh, you know, uh, different aspects of microspheres and, uh, and uh, nanoparticles. So now in the couple, uh, next two, two or three slides, uh, I, will, I will wind up this, uh, this talk here. But in the next, I just wanted to share you how important is the API quality while you prepare microspheres and nanoparticles. And as an API manufacturer, uh, how Balcom uh, can help uh, our customers and partners uh, in the, in the uh, design and, uh, and uh, manufacturing of microspheres and nanoparticles. Uh, so Markham is uh, has, uh, kind of tremendous capabilities in, in specific studies that are uh, often needed for, uh, for microspheres or nanoparticles. For example, uh, we and uh, Wacom has the capability to do aggre aggregation studies. Uh, you know, some peptides tend to aggregate, so you need to make uh, make sure that uh, peptide, you know, um, you you need to make sure that when you uh, before you formulate, you need to have the you need to characterize uh, the, um, parameters such as aggregation of peptides. Now, also, uh, as you know, like if uh, you know. Uh, if if the peptide aggregates, it could it could it, it could lead to agglomeration and uh, blood clotting and those kind of uh, scenarios possible. Um, uh, synthesis and is isolation of impurities. This is something that uh, Buckham has the capability. Um, LCMS identification of impurities, the surface area and particle size measurement, uh, development of uh, different. Uh, and, uh, Isolation techniques such as crystallization and lyophilization, spray drying, um, size exclusion chromatography techniques. So these are uh, some. Of, I just highlighted some of the capabilities that uh, Barkham can help uh, our customers in specific studies when when they deal with uh, microspheres and nanoparticles. For example, when you when you encapsulate a drug inside a microsphere, you need to make sure that doesn't the drug itself doesn't disintegrate um, it doesn't degrade um, uh, and and at some points we had uh, you know we have some customers asking us to look at the uh, the impurity profile of the drug of the drug after it is formulated and we can use some of these techniques uh, to look at the impurity profile as you formulate the drug a modification, as I uh, as, um, explained earlier, uh, formulation is just, uh, these days, it's not just the, uh, the novel approaches to formulation, it's getting different now, these days. It's not just mixing different components, it's, it's more, uh, it's moving more towards chemical modifications of the nanoparticles and, and, and formulating, uh, formulating agents. So Bakem has the capability to do conjugation, uh, techniques like pegylation, lipids, um, lipidation, for example, glycosylation, polymerization techniques, uh, for example, peptide polymerization, uh, chemistry techniques for conjugating uh, uh, peptides to other moieties, for, for example, to for example to dendrimers, uh, self um, making self assembling peptides. You know, the peptide that we that Parkham makes could self assemble into supra molecular structures. Uh, modification of nanoparticles uh, with peptides or polyethylene glycol uh, derivatives. 
Now, another important aspect is again the 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 control strategy during APMA. So, Wacom's control strategy is, is, is very important for uh, high quality drug substances and successful drug product development. So, uh, how do you control? Uh, how do you adopt a control strategy? So you, impurity profiling and impurity control during APM manifests so you you're continuously um, controlling the uh, the uh, the impurities during the API manufacturing and one way to do uh, this is basically Wacom also start with uh, the highest quality ingredients and starting materials when you make uh, an API so according to FDA guidelines, you know, quality has to be built into a, into a product. So you, you have to start with the, the best quality material while you make an API. Um, uh, we also do force degradation studies to understand stability of APIs during the formulations um, um, and impedance study of the drug product formulation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so in summary, um, uh, so Barkham is could be a, a great partner uh, when if you are if you are uh, trying to formulate a peptide drug, uh, you know, either by microparticle formulation or, or through nanoparticle uh, formulation. I just wanted to summarize uh, my discussion here. Um, uh, into a few bullet points. So microparticle formulation was successfully applied in several commercial products containing peptides as APIs. You can, so I, I gave you so many different examples um, here. Um, the use of nanoparticles for delivering peptides is still in the early stage of de development, so a lot has to be done. But so this is where uh, we are thinking that innovative ideas are going to change uh, how, the, how peptides are delivered. Yeah. Um, improved de drug delivery system based on microspheres and nanoparticles are expected to revolutionize uh, the peptide drug administration. Um, sorry about that. Uh, Barkham, uh, with decades of experience in peptide API development and manufacturing, is the uh, a best partner in achieving um, innovative approaches for drug delivery. Uh, with that, I would uh, end my uh, presentation here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. So, um, if you have any additional questions, which you weren't able to ask or um, you come up with later, you can uh, email us at the website there or at the email address there, um, which will be distributed in the slides. Um, so we'll go ahead and open it up for a question and answer. So go ahead and type uh, any questions you may have into the Q&A box. And it looks like we actually have several already. So. We'll go ahead and start with the ones we have, but feel free to add any more. Um, so Jyoti, uh, first question we have, what are the most common delivery routes for microspheres and nanoparticles? And is it possible to deliver microsphere formulations of peptides intravenously? Uh, Jyoti, you're on mute if you wanna, we can't hear you. Oh, there okay, sorry about that. Okay, okay, really, really, uh, really nice question. Um, yeah, so the microspheres, uh, so I would just start with if, you know, if you can deliver uh, uh, peptide drugs through using microspheres. Uh, the one problem with the delivering uh, microspheres uh, intravenously is because of the uh, larger particle size of these microspheres, which would, could lead to agglomeration and blood clotting. So it's not a uh, widely used uh, technique, uh, as far as I know, for a drug delivery. But microspheres are mostly used uh, in, uh, in transdermal delivery. And nanoparticles, um, there are different routes are possible. Um, and oral route is, um, is the preferred route. Um, of course, the intravenous um, or parenteral route is also possible. Uh, for the nanoparticle, there are a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Uh, 
And a uh, follow-up question to that one, is it uh, possible to administer peptides or uh, microspheres sublingually? That's a that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I think I think it's possible. Um, I don't have any specific examples, but I have. I think I think I have seen some articles uh, about this. Okay. Um, let's see. Next question: Is there any risk of passive release of peptide from the microsphere? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, uh, there, there are there are risks. Uh, it's po it's possible that, uh, but uh, once you, uh, you know, the the the, the mechanism itself, me mechanism of the. I mean, once you make the microsphere, you are you are you have to ensure that peptide is well encapsulated inside the microsphere. Once it is inside and it's stable, then you, once you administer uh, the mechanism itself of uh, uh, the um, delivery of the drug from the microsphere is through uh, polymer degradation, for example, as it degrades, uh, the drug is slowly released into the, into the system. Thank you. And um, another audience question, uh, how can targeting of specific sites be achieved through uh, using microsphere particles? It's, um, I think, it's, uh, um, targeting specific sites. I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's challenging. I think you would be you know, better off using uh, nanoparticle uh, type of delivery uh, for specific targeting because you have the ability to modify the nanoparticles with a specific targeting ligands. You might be also, uh, it might be possible, to, or I think in the case of microspheres also to modify the microsphere surface with uh, ligands that specifically target a certain site. Thank you. Um... We have a couple specific questions here uh, related to peptide size. Uh, so can uh, microspheres and nanoparticles be used for delivery of small peptides of about 10 amino acids? Yes, yeah, I think it's possible. Because you are encapsulating it inside the microsphere and, uh, and nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. Uh, another specific uh, length related question. Um, is there any specific type of particles that would be ideal in delivering a 40, 40 amino acid peptide? Um, this question was specifically for diabetic foot issues. Can you repeat the question again one more time? Uh, what type of particles would be ideal in delivering a 40 amino acid peptide? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, in the in, if you are using a uh, nanoparticle delivery system, is is hundred nanometer is the ideal uh, uh, size of the nanoparticle that could be used. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my micro microspheres are again, it's, it's uh, the size of the microsphere is larger, right? So mm -hmm. it could be more, it could be larger than thousand nanometers, typically. Okay, more questions streaming in. Um, so uh, next question is regarding clearance from the body. Uh, how are microspheres and nanoparticles cleared from the body after use? And is there any adverse immune response expected? That's a very good question. Um, so the lymphatic system would clear, uh, you know, uh, the uh, you know, particles from our body, so there is a mechanism for that, um, and you can also also know for in case of microspheres or nanoparticles, um, uh, you know they actually 
most uh, uh, some of them are uh, most widely used uh, microspheres or nanoparticles are biodegradable actually degrades inside the body and cleared mm -hmm. um, yes uh, you know cleared uh, just like uh, clearance of any other material from the body but i think there is an issue with the nanoparticle if the particle size is small and um, the body would try to clear it off uh, the lymphatic system Mm -hmm. And then toxicity has to be, uh, you know, that's what uh, that is what I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, we need to be careful about the toxicity of this and and also the immune response. We we have seen in recently that, uh, for example, uh, uh, peg related materials, uh, you know, they actually impart uh, immune response and uh, some specific antibodies are formed for this uh, this kind of uh, ingredients. So that is why you see that sometimes you have you will have immune response to these ingredients. Mm -hmm. So the, this will be a case to case uh, you know basis. Thank you. Um, next one is regarding uh, approval for this type of technology. So. Uh, which microsphere so far has proven uh, to have the best risk to benefit ratio for pulmonary delivery, um, possibly already approved by FDA? That's a good question. I don't have an answer now for this uh, on top of my mind. Uh, but um, I think um, most commonly used one is the PLGA microspheres, but I need, I'll need to I'll need to check uh, which one is specifically used for uh, pulmonary delivery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, is it possible to produce uh, microsphere nanoparticles for triggered release of peptide drugs? I think if you if you if you meet you know if you can for a trigger release you need to meet some conditions if you can meet those conditions uh, so that the drug is uh, released uh, through a trigger I think it's 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 possible I think it's just like a controlled drug release. Again, I don't have specific examples at this point, but uh, I think. Uh, there are some publications on this uh, aspect as well. Okay, uh, this is a question about uh, Bachem's capabilities. Um, does Bachem supply uh, microspheres in bulk? Laura, can you repeat that question? I, there was, uh, uh, does Bachem supply microspheres in bulk form? Uh, so no. So uh, at this point, Bachem uh, doesn't uh, manufacture uh, my, my, you know, microspheres. Um, uh, you know, our main focus is, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, is the API manufacturing and also the modifications. Mm -hmm. Let me look through. We have a few more questions. Okay, we have uh, an analytical question. Uh, what is the best way to characterize or analyze uh, the surface of the nanoparticle when it was modified or vectorized with some peptide? It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think there are, uh, you can, you might be able to use specific NMR methods for characterization, depending on the moieties on the surface of the, of the nanoparticles. And also IR, infrared spectroscopy. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I think IR and uh, NMR, mm -hmm. these, are the, these are the techniques that you can use. Uh, another question, uh, are collagen nanoparticles 
common for peptide drug delivery? I haven't seen a lot of, uh, when I reviewed the literature, I haven't seen a lot of examples, but there are some examples there. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, the diameter of a capillary lumen ranges from five to 10 micrometer. Uh, if we use nanoparticles, is there a chance of them entering into the bloodstream rather than a topical action? So this sounds like a, a um, topical application of this. Yeah, I think that the, this I, 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 if I understand this correctly, I think this is talking about the needle size and uh, um, you need to know is use appropriate needle size uh, for uh, administration. I think there is a possibility that, yeah, it could enter into, um, yeah. and I think there, there, there is a possibility always small, a small quantity of this going into the uh, bloodstream. But anyway, when, even if you do anything transdermally, there is a possibility that it would go into the, the system. system. Uh, it would, you know, a part of it would enter into the, into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And a question about uh, ocular application. Can this technology be used via the ocular route? And if so, uh, are there any known challenges or risks to the patient? So the best example is the rest, rest stasis, which I showed earlier. So um, I have seen a lot of uh, articles and uh, literature in this area. Um, I think the challenges would be, the main challenge would be uh, um, but the ocular, what I would like to say is that uh, the ocular delivery is getting you know, it's very popular, uh, getting popular with this nanoparticle delivery system. One challenge is the, uh, the possibility of aggregation, solubility, the peptide, uh, and it has to be, one has to be sure that the peptide doesn't aggregate and form uh, agglomerates and uh, so that's the, those are some of the challenges. The, the the challenges basically with the the API itself, and if it aggregates during the formulation, or 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 if you keep it for longer uh, time. Mm -hmm. uh, and a question about stability: um, How exactly? Do nanoparticles uh, protect a small peptide from degradation? So the so the so so the nanoparticle act as an envelope around the 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 peptide. For example, if you take a simple example, even though you cannot call it as just you know, as a nanoparticle, but if you pegylate a peptide. The peculation, uh, like if you have a large molecular weight pack surrounding a peptide molecule, actually it's kind of um, protect the peptide uh, by. Uh, I would say, if in case in, the, in 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 the in case of nanoparticles, kind of coating the peptide around, and uh, it it increases the stability of the peptide that way. It protects. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, and we are almost out of time. So we have one last question. Um, are there any approaches to enhance the controlled release? I think there are so many approaches. Um, if you look at some of my, the, the few slides in the beginning where you, you, you control uh, porosity, for example, of the, of the microsphere uh, ingredients or uh, size. Um, and so, so it's all about uh, changing the uh, parameters for, for the microsphere preparation, such as the most, most likely the porosity and um, particle size that would impact the, the controlled release. And also the stability of the of the microsphere itself and to certain conditions. 
Thank you. All right, so that is all of our uh, participant questions. Um, if you have any additional questions or um, any interest in uh, what Bachem can offer to help develop these technologies, um, you can send an email to the uh, email address listed here and it will be directed to the appropriate um, salesperson or SME to get you your answer. Um, and we are out of time. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, video recording of this will be available, I believe, on YouTube and on our website.